Hello, it's Sarah from Hardcover Hearts, and I'm here for a kind of different video. This is a review video. Now, I don't tend to do these uh, too often because I talk about books as I read them uh, and, and do that in my week of reading updates. However, uh, this one is special, and I think it deserved uh, a little extra oomph and a, and a special focus. Uh, this is... The Mitfords, Letters Between Six Sisters, edited by Charlotte Mosley. So I wanted to give a special uh, video about this to recommend it, to give you a sense of why this book is so exceptional and uh, why I think this would be a great read for many, many people. Okay, so let me kind of back up a little bit and I'm going to put this down because this is incredibly heavy. It's about 800 pages and this is a uh, a nice, sturdy, hefty book. So let me give you an example of why the Mitford family is so interesting. Uh, is the family in brief. Uh, so it's an arist aristocratic family. They had many estates, many, many properties, but were in essence poor because they ha owed so much money in debt taxes and debt dues that they didn't have a lot of income. And so it, it, they were... It was an interesting combination for this family of having entree, access. Uh, they were family members with so many uh, aristocrats, so many of the peers, but had no money to kind of go into those social social circles. The other challenge that they had was they were helmed by Favre, and that is the father of the family, and he was a lord. And his name, his title, his name is David, but his title was Lord Redesdale, and. He was known to be not just eccentric in kind of the ha-ha, funny, eccentric kind of manner, but volatile, violent, uh, a little unhinged. Uh, not violent in the sense that he hurt the children or beat them or beat his wife, but violent in outbursts. Uh, and and un, uh, you didn't really know what was going to set him off. He also was very dictatorial and had very strong rules. And one of the rules was he did not believe in any formal education for the girls. Uh, so this is a family of six girls and one boy. Uh, Tom, unfortunately, died in the war. Uh, and so it was left to everything was, was about the girls after that. Uh, and they were also not allowed to have other friends in in uh, in the village or in the area surrounding surrounding the estate so it was all about them they were isolated uneducated poor but also titled very interesting combination right uh within this little microcosm these girls created incredibly strong personalities, uh, despite the fact that their mother was very passive and, and a little cold and distant, or at least that's uh, to, to Nancy, the first one. So let's kind of talk through the, the number of, of children that they had and each of them so we get a, get a full picture. So there was Nancy. She's the oldest. She's the author. Uh, she also uh, was a Francophile. She, uh, when she was old enough, uh, she left home and moved to Paris and fell in love with Paris. Uh, she was married. She had an early marriage. It did not uh, go well. And she ended up falling in love with a Frenchman who was a very famous diplomat. Uh, he, They had an affair, but her love for him was all-encompassing, and he did not share the same feelings about her, which is one of the, the great um, sadnesses in her life. Uh, and their friendship lasted their, her entire life. Uh, second in line was Pamela. And Pamela is such a cipher because we don't know a lot about Pamela. And there's not even a lot about her in the letters. She seems to be very much of a recluse homebody, quiet, reserved. Uh, she loved cooking. She, so she's always talking about food. And she had a photographic memory of menus and food that was served on certain occasions. And she also loved animals. She's a complete animal lover. She's always talking about uh, certain animals uh, that she has, her dogs. Uh, and it does seem like she did marry and it was a marriage that did not survive. And she had a, a woman lover for many, many years that was her companion. 
So I'm not sure if her reticence to, to be engaged in the family or be engaged in the world is because of, of her relationship. Uh, it doesn't seem so. It seems like it was really her personality because it's not like we have letters up until a certain point and then it stops. So th there's there's that. But Pamela is the, the one that we don't know a lot about. Next up is Diana. Now, Diana was the beauty. She was renowned for being astoundingly beautiful. And she was a member of, of what the press called the bright young things in the 20s. She came out in society and then almost immediately married uh, Brian Guinness of the Guinness Fortune. Uh, that marriage produced two children, but it was not necessarily a happy one for her. Uh, she really loved society. She loved going out. She was intellectually curious and really wanted to be engaged in life. And Brian wanted to retreat and have a, a home life. And that was not something that was interesting to her. Uh, their marriage crumbled when she met and was introduced to Sir Oswald Mosley. Now, he was a very interesting character for Americans who don't know who he is. Uh, I did not know who he was. Uh, he started the uh, basically the British Union of Fascists. He was a fascist leader, uh, and he was working with Germany and, and Hitler so that he could promote and have his speeches and have his platform so he could push fascism in the UK. She was absolutely besotted immediately uh, taken with his magnetism and his charm and his force. And there is some sense and idea that maybe because because Favre was such a dominant man that she, that, that, that was something that kind of in, imprinted in her mind, uh, even though he was not a fascist, but, you know, just this, this very masculine dominant figure, uh, was, was something that she fell completely under his, under his spell. They had a torrid affair. She ended up leaving uh, her husband and setting up as his official mistress without any hope of, of being married to him at that time because he was uh, married uh, when they started their affair. And this was very, very well known. It was not hidden at all, which produced a tremendous scandal in the family, one of the first of many. And they would get married. They were married at Joseph Goebbels' home in Germany, and the guest of honor was Hitler in their, in their wedding. Uh, so they're not running with the best of people. When they came came back to the UK, they were arrested and they were both detained. Uh, Diana was detained for four years in prison. At a certain point, they thought that that Oswald Mosley was going to was was in such deterioration of health that he was going to die, and they didn't want to make a martyr of him, so they released him to home confinement with with Diana, and they which created an outrage because their home. Uh, they had money. Uh, other members of the family did not, but they absolutely did. And so, you know, how, how t difficult is home confinement when your home is in a state? Uh, and they were reunited with the children that they had had, uh, that, that Diana was separated from when they were really infants and a, and a baby. Uh, so that must have been a very, very difficult time uh, for her. But at the same time, you know, they were promoting fascism. Uh, so interesting, interesting life. So they ended up moving to France as well. They moved around a few places, moved to France, and Diana became a writer. She would write book reviews. She would write uh, essays, uh, uh, political essays. She was also very political. Uh, she stood behind mostly, but she really propped him up. So she would edit and help him write his his speeches and his letters. Uh, and was always helping, always trying to make sure that he came off in the best light. Seems like she knows that he was often uh, obsessed with his self-image and not really listening to uh, to better advice that came to him. So very, in, very interesting couple, very interesting uh, aspect of the family. Uh, then we have unity. Unity, I think, is the most scandalous, as if as if Diana wasn't already scandalous, then you have you up the ante with unity. Unity was known for always just being really bold and outrageous. 
uh, they're saying that at some of the parties that they would go to, you know, uh, some people would wear feather boas and she would actually wear a boa. She would wear a snake and, and come into these parties. Now, she was very tall, very statuesque and just very aggressive, you know, just kind of an in your face type of personality. Uh, she went to Germany and was kind of studying in Germany and became besotted with Hitler. And when we say besotted, it's almost like a uh, beetle mania. So they were, when the first time she saw him driving down the, down the street, she started crying. Uh, she found out that he went to this cafe and she would show up at the cafe. She would be shaking so much she couldn't even drink her tea, uh, and would drop things and, uh, and just wanted to get his attention, wanted an introduction, and finally was introduced to him. And when Hitler found out that she was the daughter of a lord, uh, of course, he brought her into his inner circle. And she was no, she was photographed, and she was a huge proponent of of Nazism. She went to the rallies. There's photos of her state hiling. Uh, she. Uh, she just became a, a, an advocate for Nazism. Now you have to understand that Winston Churchill is a distant cousin and, and she really wanted England to adopt Nazism. She was wanted to, to kind of create a, a bond between the two countries. And she was so absolutely devastated when England and Germany declared war against each other that in an act of protest, very unity style uh, act of protest, she went to a public park with a gun and uh, tried to shoot herself in the head and was unsuccessful. So she was immediately taken to the hospital with horrible, horrible injuries. The family was notified, uh, but they couldn't, they could, weren't allowed to get into Germany to get her. Hitler allowed her to be taken to Switzerland, a neutral neutral country, and Churchill allowed the family to travel to Switzerland and to bring her back to a massive uproar, you know? So a lot of people were very angry that this very privileged young woman ha gets such treatment uh, to be uh, brought back uh, to, to be in comfort with her family when um, Nazis were doing so much atro atrocities in, uh, in the country and bombing is, is starting. So unity was was permanently never, never the same after this. Uh, she basically would have these uncontrollable outbursts. Her, her mentality was more like a petulant teenager, like maybe 12 or 13. Uh, she would throw into these rages at her at her sister who would come to stay with her and try to help. And her mother basically had to devote herself to the care of her daughter. Now, the mother was also a fan of Hitler and uh, thought that his policies were great. And he was just such a fabulous character. Um, so she basically had to devote the rest of her life to, to taking care of unity at considerable expense to her personal life, to her sanity and, and her health. Unity did end up passing away because of a infection in the wound uh, about eight years after the original incident occurred. But those eight years really took a toll on the family. Uh, one of also the years leading up to when she became the poster child for, for uh, Nazism. So then we have Jessica. Jessica, I always found to be the most fascinating because she and Unity were closest in age and shared a room and created their own little language and their own little bond. And Jessica was outraged by Diana and Unity and thought that it was it was a travesty. And in turn, she became a communist. And in a very uh, sneaky way that was never that was uh, something that created the big one of the bigger rifts in the family. Uh, she ran away from home and didn't tell any of the family, anyone, and was missing for two weeks. No one knew where she was. And uh, it created such consternation and such fear in the family. She, what she had done is she had fallen in love with, uh, I think, Winston Churchill's nephew and uh, escaped with him to Spain. And there they were helping in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, she was in love, deeply in love with him. And uh, this was an act of defiance against uh, her upbringing in the aristocratic environment that was, she specifically was very angry at being told that she was not allowed to have an education 
and then watching her sisters um, fall fall into these horrible, horrible parties. They ended up moving to the United States and she uh, suffered tremendously. She suffered uh, the death of her child and her husband came back to fight against the Nazis when uh, war, war broke out and was missing in action, never to be found again. Years later, she met a man and ended up marrying him. He, he was a very prominent social rights lawyer, a Jewish man, and they ended up moving here to Oakland, California. Live, they live literally uh, a walk away from where I live today and uh, were heavily, heavily active involved in the civil rights um work. And so she became friends with people like Maya Angelou and wrote uh, very, very frequently about uh, about things that were going on in America. So she wrote a very famous book about um, the death industry and a funeral, funeral area, funeral, funeral, that's the word, funeral services and that whole industry and, and how it works. And she became kind of like an investigative reporter and writing these pieces, uh, which became very interesting. She was such a good writer. And so you see a theme that, that, that a lot of these women were, ended up becoming writers. She would return on occasion to visit the family, uh, but the, she never, there were only uh, two letters that were passed between her and, and uh, Diana uh, because that split was was absolute and, and complete. She did have a break with Unity, but Unity loved her so much. Unity uh, tried to find a way to still be friends and maintain that bond, even though they had a political, kind of a separation of the familial relationship and and uh, the political stances that they took. Lastly, let's get to Deborah. Deborah is the baby of the family and is really known as the family diplomat. She would try to pull everyone together and speak for the other and try to help everyone kind of soften over these, these chasms of, of difference and, and hurt feelings and disappointment, deep disappointment. Uh, she had married uh, Andrew, and Andrew uh, became the uh, Duke of Devonshire. He was not expected to inherit. He was the second son, but his older brother died, and they ended up inheriting Chatsworth Estate, which is this um, remarkable, remarkable estate, And but with it came incredibly heavy uh, death dues and taxes. And she became really a businesswoman. She really understood uh, how to organize, how to get things done. They did a complete refurbishment and renovation of, of the estate. Uh, she established a, a store, a restaurant, uh, had, would use the estate as uh, event for events and really became this, this uh, amazing, amazing woman as the Duchess of Devonshire. And uh, so I have to say, I, I went into this book expecting to uh, deepen my love for Jessica, but I, my admiration for Deborah uh, really, really came through here. So let me talk, let me return back to the letters. So why is this book so important? So now we know like the intricacies of this family, but this le the reason the letters is so valuable as, as a book is three three things I want to talk about. The first is just the structure is so uh, engaging as a historical document um, of their lives, of this one specific family. The structure allows this to be a standalone document. You don't have to know anything other. You don't have to have read any of their writings. You don't have to have read any biographies. This can be your entree. First off, you have it starts with biographical notes. So you have to have the, bi the biography of how these people all fit together. Then you need an index of nicknames because these women were famous for giving each other and people in their in their social circle nicknames. And these nicknames are really good uh, and they lasted forever. Once you were, you know, you may have a second nickname, but you always had a nickname. Then there's the family tree. Then there's the editor's notes. Charlotte Mosley, uh, you get from the last name, is uh, a descendant of Diana and Sir Oswald Mosley. I think she did a phenomenal job at staying neutral to some of the uh, more challenging aspects of, of Diana's past and Diana's history. Uh, 
And then there's the introduction. So you have a lot of, of stuff to kind of set you up going into the into the letters. Then what they've done is she's taken uh, little snippets of time. So the first section is from 1925 to 33. And so we get we we are going through the letters chronologically. So it's not event based. It's 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 chronological, which I think allows us to get a sense of who these women were, what is happening to them, what is happening to the world and, and how their relationships are changing. She starts off every section with that historical overview, with that overlay of, of this is what was going on in each of them in the world uh, and in their relationships, and then goes into each of the letters. And each of the letters also has footnotes to specific incidents, uh, people, uh, and, and it helps you understand how they are communicating with each other. So it's 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 a remarkable uh understanding of that period in time of what's happening in France and Germany and England, uh, as well as the family. The second thing is just the amount of access that they had because of not just their social connections, but also their his the political connections that they had uh, is is un unparalleled. Um, you know, Hitler, Churchill, uh, the House of Lords, all of these people uh, are documented in here through their interactions. You get the splintering political view. So you're not just getting one point of view of one party. You're getting the, the different factions and those relationships there and how they're, they're thinking about the other. And also you're getting the societal, all of the people that they knew in society as an example. Evelyn Waugh was a very good friend of Nancy Mitford. He was considered a, a peer. He was considered a contemporary. Maybe even they shared and overlapped some of the same uh, criticism in the sense that they were both sharp barbed. They both talked about the aristocracy. Um, and so there was a little competitiveness um, it, it happening between them. And their relationship it really goes through an evolution and change. And the whole, entire family knew him because Nancy would bring him and was introduced. And then the third, and I think this is the most important for me, I'm always fascinated with with complex women relationships, uh, stories and and fiction and and true life stories of really uh, relationships that go beyond just the frenemies, uh, but beyond just the competitiveness, beyond just the deep loyalty. Um, I like the I like the deep roots that sometimes tangle, and are hard to to pull apart, uh, and that's what it comes through in here. Uh, in here, you see deep, deep bonds because of their their need for each other when they were children and the fact that they only had each other. You see the bitter disappointments that they have in the choices that each other make and and how they want different for the, for each other. You see the loyalties and you also see the betrayals. You see their their intellectual pride at the fact that despite the fact that that they were never oh, properly educated, uh, they still are are able to hold their own. Uh, most many of them were novelists or writers, uh, and they they are known for their incredible wit, their incredible sharpness, and they have a way of speaking that is the Midford accent, the Midford vocabulary, and the Midford language. Again, unique. Uh, the humor. They are so much. So many jokes in here, so much teasing, so many references to previous things that happened and, and um, that you end up, it's very hard at the beginning because you're trying to find your way into this very insular world. But as you go through and near the end, you're getting it, you understand and you're seeing the same jokes repeated over and over again, the same nicknames over and over again. And you start to understand and, and, and follow along with it and it becomes quite quite, quite amusing. They are funny, funny women. Even when they're talking about very dark things, they're really funny. Uh, and it's a biting humor. It's, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's cynical, but it's sharp. It's very sharp. But I think what, what makes this so fascinating is the secrets, the things that we know that they don't even know about each other. Uh, an example, this is, I, I'm not spoiling anything, uh, but Nancy Mitford, actually was one of the people to petition to have her sister put in jail. Knowing that her sister had just given birth uh, to another baby, 
but she not only petitioned to have her and, and was a witness to putting her in jail, she also petitioned to not have her be released. Now, I understand the hatred for her. She hated all, she hated all of her brother-in-laws, FYI, but I understand her specific aversion to Sir Oswald mostly. Uh, but it just seems like there's, there's an extra personal dig there. And uh, her sister never knew she had done that. Not even after Nancy's death, never knew that her sister had had done that. So really, you're reading this and you see you see these things happen. You see the anger that Diana has toward Jessica for rejecting her, and never knowing that her that her older sister that she was still still close with had actually been the one to 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 draw the knife in more more deeply. And for me, I think I'm always, especially now in, in our society, I'm always fascinated by how, how do you talk across the aisle? How do you hold, hold firm with, with deep love and familial ties for people who are doing things that are odious to you, that are actually uh, hurting other people? I am lucky that I don't have this specific problem uh, in my personal family uh, of the people that I'm really deeply close to. But I don't, but it's always been fascinating to me and I really don't know how it is. I tend to have a, uh, a very draconian, uh, hardcore stance in, in that. But, but this gave me uh, insights into how you can maybe split off and but ultimately, these women never converted anybody else to their opinions. They, it was it never happened. Uh, they were always firm in their beliefs uh, because of their strong character. So, on those uh, those are all of my reasons why I gave this five stars, and I highly highly recommend if you are interested in uh, fascinating women characters, uh, or, or aristocratic families that, that are beyond the pale. Uh, if you're interested in these, in this time in the world, if you're interested in any of those political characters, if you're interested in any of these women as authors, uh, this is a phenomenal book. At that, I will stop because it's a very long, very long, uh, video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll look forward to seeing you again. Bye.